Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another episode of the show and I've taken it on the road for a little bit. Um, I'm over here at uh, the Westin at La Cantera here in San Antonio. Uh, we're at the Francesca, the restaurant here. Um, can't really see the view too much because the sun's coming through, but it's a wonderful view. I've been here a couple times. Um, I'm here with Stephanie Putnam of Raymond Vineyards um, and she's providing some of the wine here for a wine dinner we're doing in association with Culinaria, um, which is all this week here in San Antonio. Um, so Stephanie, tell me a little bit about yourself and what kind of you know who you are and who you're with and all that. Okay. okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Putnam. I'm the director of winemaking for Raymond Vineyards. I've been the winemaker here for about two and a half years. I'm very okay. blessed to be here. Prior to that, I was the winemaker at Farniente as well as Hess Collection. All right. But Raymond Vineyards has always been a very special place for me. When uh, the Boisset family purchased it in 2009, I begged at the chance to be the winemaker because when I first started out, Raymond was my first benchmark. So I wanted to be here and be part of the team that really helped elevate Raymond Vineyards to the next level. Okay. Raymond Vineyards. Yes. Wait, no, go ahead. go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Raymond Vineyards is an iconic Napa Valley winery. We were established in 1974 by the Raymond family who can trace their winemaking legacy back to the late 1800s to the Beringer family. Okay. All right. So um, for people that maybe are not familiar with Raymond, where, where are you uh, located in California? Oh, sorry. Uh, Raymond Vineyards is located in Napa Valley, just south of the town of Santa Elena. We have, we have vineyards in uh, southern Napa, where Chardonnay is from. Vineyards on our estate in Rutherford, where we grow Merlot and Cabernet, from which we produce our Napa Valley Reserve and Cabernet. All right, great. So you've been with Raymond for? Two and a half years. Two and a half years, okay. And uh, you're with, um, uh, now I see, this is me forgetting stupid things. Um, <laughs> you're with Hess and Beringer, right? Hess and Farniente. And Farniente, that's right, Farniente. Yes. Beringer, we mentioned Beringer, so Farniente. So, who were you with before uh, Raymond? Was it Farniente? It was Farniente, yes. Okay. I was a winemaker there for eight years. Okay. Now, what got you into winemaking? Wow. Well, this is, a, this is actually a true story because you couldn't make this up. So, okay. when I was a kid, I grew up in San Francisco. I grew, I was, grew up drinking wine. I could have wine with my meals, with my parents. But I actually went to Davis to be an FBI agent. And uh oh. <laughs> be afraid. And. After about a year of pursuing the degree I was go going for political science, I discovered that at the time that there was a height requirement and that you had to be 5'2", honest to God, and so I'm wearing heels right now. Oh, no. On a good hair day, I'm 4'11 and a half. So, Still, I mean, come clearly on. Clearly at 19, on. I was not going to get any taller, so my career was cut short before you even started. <clears throat> so I looked to wine, which I grew up with, and I've never looked back. All right, so, um, so did you get your degree at UC Davis with wine? I do. I have a uh, BS in fermentation science, yes. Okay, great. So then after college, where did you go? After college, I was a grunt in the cellars of Hess Collection, and I worked in the cellar for a year, and I was able to progress to uh, become winemaker after several years. Okay. So you, you, couldn't, you couldn't be an FBI agent, so you decided you know, to do the wine thing. Why was it um, wine making and not any other aspect of the wine industry? I think because I was always intrigued by about how you put something so beautiful in the bottle. I wanted to be part of that uh, process. The ability to challenge yourself against Mother Nature and every year is different is okay. what intrigues me. Okay. All right. So over at Raymond, um, what type of, uh, what, what, I guess, what's your portfolio of wine? We have a varied portfolio. So we have a, under our reserve, which is all Napa Valley fruit, we have a Chardonnay. Sauvignon Blanc, Merlot, and Cabernet. We also have our clutch wines, which are all California-based, so more value-driven. Mm -hmm. Again, Cabernet, Merlot, Chardonnay, and a field blend, which has been outrageously popular. Something that we're pouring here tonight 
is our Psalm selection. That's a brand new wine for us, and that is a wine that we create with Psalms from across the country. It's Cabernet. Okay. And then our highest end is Generations, which is our Ultra Premier Luxury wine. Okay, so um, let's go over some of the wines we are having today. Tonight? Okay. So we are having our Reserve Chardonnay, which comes from our state in Southern Napa. More of a refined, elegant style of Chardonnay. If you don't like Chardonnay, I challenge you to try ours, because typically the people who say they don't like it love our Chardonnay. It's a lot of acid, a lot of fruit, not overly done. We're also having our Reserve Merlot, which is your, again, your atypical Merlot. It's a very serious Merlot, which drinks more like a Cabernet. Okay, all right. And we're having our Reserve Cab, which is our flagship wine, the wine that we've been doing since 1974. And then, of course, to finish off the evening, the wine that Stephen Kruger helped blend is our sommelier selection, Cabernet. All right, yes, and we'll be talking with Stephen a little bit, so we'll talk about his particular wine. Um, so, I guess about each of the wines, can you give me just a little bit about each of the each of the wines that we're going to be having? Sure. So I think we're going to start off with our Chardonnay. And the Chardonnay, again, is more of a refined style. It comes from our estate in southern Napa. It's a non-malolactic style, so it's got a nice crisp acidity. It's a food wine. It's a partial barrel and stainless steel fermentation, so we like to really highlight the fruit. There is a small amount of wood in there. Again, we want the oak to really lift the fruit, but not overwhelm the fruit. Uh, everything is surly, surly age, meaning stirring uh, the leaves every two weeks in the tank or the barrel to get a little bit more creaminess, okay. a little bit more length, uh, but it's really more about balance on this wine. All right. So what are we going to have next? Next, we're going to have our Reserve Merlot, and again, this is one that is more of a drinks like a cavern, and that, be that is because it comes from our estate in Rutherford. It's probably the wine that, uh, out of all of the Reserve ones, it really speaks to the terroir of Rutherford. Rutherford is a small sub-appellation within uh, the larger appellation of Napa Valley and it's known for Rutherford dust. So it makes wines that have a lot of minerality, some clay, earthy characters, mushroomy, very meaty wine, also a lot of structure and firm tannins. And so that Merlot has a lot of firmness and a lot of structure to it. It still has your classic black cherry but it has a lot of structure, and that's why I say it's more of a typical Merlot. It drinks more like a Cabernet. In fact, I blend Cabernet in to help soften it. Okay, well, how much um, is it? I'm sure every year is a little bit different, but about how it's much right, Cabernet? Roughly 10% or so. It changes a little bit, but that's on average in general. Okay, all right, and then after that, what are we gonna have? Uh, after that, we're gonna have our Reserve Cabernet, again, which is our flagship wine, the one that we've been doing since 1974. That is actually the reason that I'm at Raymond today. Uh, I had mentioned earlier, I believe, that when I was at Hess Collection, that was the wine that I originally started comparing myself to. When I was at Hess, we had a uh, similar price point, similar scores, similar volume. So it was really the first wine that I started comparing myself to in terms of how are they doing versus what I'm doing. So the Reserve Cab is a very special wine for me. It comes from our estate in Rutherford and St. Helena. Uh, it is barrel aged for you know, roughly 18 months, 100% French oak, about 35% or so uh, new French. It's all extended maceration. I think the 2009 is about 27 days on the skin total, and I think it's the first wine, uh, the first vintage from uh, under the Boisset ownership that really shows you the direction that we're going with our wines. Okay. Um, something that, I mean, I pretty much know this, but I, in reading books and reading articles and and all the stuff and watching stuff, um, we talk about oak and all that, and it just kind of like you get these stats of, well, it's you know 100% such and such oak, and it's, it's this percentage of new versus old. Tell me why you have a certain percentage of new versus old, kind of how it how it develops the wine. Well, uh, determining the amount of new oak versus old oak is all about trying to create the balance in the wine. So what you want to do is you want to create a wine that has uh, the complexity and layers that oak can give it and some dimensions without trying to take away from the fruit. And so it's about finding out which wines or which oak percentage works with your wine. Uh, our Generations wine, which is our uh, ultra premium wine, is typically higher oak. It's about 50 to 100% new French oak because we make that to be a bigger wine so it can stand up to more French oak. But with our Chardonnay and our Cabernet, 
we're making that to really highlight the fruit and the texture of the wine. And if it's too much oak, sometimes you take away from the texture of the wine. All right, so there you go. Um, it's, it's good to get a, a good explanation of that. I mean, one of those things, you, you, wine people tend to, at least wine people in where, where I'm at, uh, tend to know what it's supposed to be, but a lot, of, a lot of my viewers may not understand that they just hear oak and French and American and new and old, and they're like, yeah, I don't get it. It's just an oak to them. So um, that's why I have a winemaker. I can, you know, not that, not that Stephen wouldn't know, because Stephen definitely would obviously know all this stuff, but it's good to hear from the winemaker too, because you, you live it every day. All right, so uh, talk to me about how the terroir is a little bit different in Rutherford than the rest of Napa. So the terroir of Rutherford is really, the terroir really comes down to soil, air, and climate. So it's really all about the physical space. It's more than just the soil. Rutherford is a warmer, is a warmer climate, but also has heavier soils, so it tends to really slow down the ripening process. If it weren't for the heavier soils, I think we would get fruit that um, would ripen too fast. You would get number, you would get physical ripeness, or sugar ripeness without getting actual physical ripeness. And so the balance with the soil and the heat really gets allows you to get the sugar ripeness at the same time as you get physical ripeness. All right, and I think that's something where a lot of people don't understand. You, you know, the grape could be ripe, but the sugar levels yeah. may not be where you need them to be correct. Right, exactly. And there's sometimes they can, the sugars can be too high, but you can still have green flavors in the wine, and so you don't have physical ripeness. You want the balance of the numbers and the physical ripeness. All right, cool. Well, uh, Stephanie, it's been really great to have you here on the show. Um, we're gonna wrap it up uh, with this segment. We're gonna uh, move on to um, uh, our next two guests. So I do wanna appreciate you uh, taking some time right, with thank me. Thank you, thank and, you. And uh, thank you very much, appreciate right, it. Thank you very All much. Right. All right, everybody, uh, we are now uh, with Steven Kruger uh, here. He's the song here at Francesca um, here at the West End Lock and Terra. And um, he's going to be uh, the song for tonight. Well, he's the song here, but um, he's, uh, uh, get, he's been the person that's been really putting all this together with the wine um, and uh, with Chef uh, Eric, right? Uh, Ernie is Ernie. Is Ernie. I don't know why I said Eric. <laughs> Ernie, and I even knew this. Yeah, Sarni's been with us for many years now, and he's uh, an incredible, accomplished chef. Uh, he's able to put together a flavor profile, layers of flavor in a way that I haven't seen any other chef be able to do. And it's, it's been gratifying to, to work with him over these many years. All right, great. So um, let's uh, let's introduce to Stephen. So Stephen, tell me a little about yourself. Uh, where, where you know who you are. How did you get into all this, and uh, and how did you get over here to this wonderful place, Francesca? Well, uh, I worked in uh, restaurants for many years. I'm from San Antonio, uh, which a lot of people ask me. I guess they didn't realize that I am from San Antonio. On my dad's side of the family, I'm fifth generation in the area, so uh, I have some roots here. And um, you know, growing up, I, I didn't know had never heard the word sommelier, and uh, before we opened the resort, uh, one of my bosses had mentioned sommelier to me, and I didn't know what he was talking about, honestly. And uh, then when we opened the resort, uh, we had uh, Virginia Phillip, who's going to be here tonight for the uh, Raymond dinner. Uh, she came and she taught classes here at the resort and uh, recognized my passion and my my um, interest in wine and got me in the Court of Master Swine's uh, certification process. And so I got my uh, certificate in uh, uh, 2000 and then uh, began uh, uh, working with the wine program and uh, alcohol sales here uh, more and more over the years. And uh, have been uh, teaching staff here and uh, refining our uh, wine list, making it a little better uh, every month. And uh, just uh, having some great dinners, some great events, and uh, being in a, a dream situation, you know, a little piece of paradise here. Okay. Um, so uh, you've been here for quite a while um, in the capacity of, as a song. Um, do you, as a song, do you see yourself going, pursuing the master, or are you comfortable where you're at, or you haven't decided yet? I've taken the advanced exam, but I haven't passed it, so I need to study more and reapply. I, I would like to achieve the advanced, and uh, you know, then if they deem me worthy, they'll invite me to the master's level. Okay, 
Um, is that is that a, is that something that you want to pursue, or is it as far as the master yes. level? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. And uh, I mean, there's there's a movie coming out soon. I'm I'm pretty excited yeah. to watch it. Um, I've actually met some of those guys in the in the in the film from going to Texas. Um, so, uh, uh, what what drives you to want to pursue higher or, or pursue the master? Because I've been watching the, the, the preview of the movie and talking to some masters. It's grueling. It, it is. The advanced test was uh, very difficult, um, and you know it, it's. It's a fascinating, you know, life-encompassing subject, and you know, if you, if you I guess, fall into that abyss of learning, uh, you, you, you want to be able to kind of swim, sink or swim, I guess. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so your role here at Francesca, um, with the song, kind of go over what do you do? Because um, I mean, a lot of people. First of all, like just like just like you, I didn't know what a sommelier was, and I had a boss somewhere else that said, "Hey, we'll pay for your education," and, and ended up paying for all myself. But um, <laughs> well, because I ended up leaving the company and moving to San Antonio. Yeah. But um, you know, the same idea. You know, we have this. You know, this is a, something that you might be interested in. I was the only person that said, "Yes, I'd like to do this." But um, kind of describe what your role here um, is at Francesca. The, definitely the uh, glamour side of it is uh, walking the, the floor during dinner service and uh, meeting guests that are enthusiastic about wine and curious about wine and wanting recommendations, wanting to taste new and different things. Uh, and, you know, that's a very gratifying part of it. Um, you know, meeting the people like Stephanie Putnam along the way, you know, whether they're uh, you're going to them or they're coming to you, they come and show you their wines here in the restaurant and get to taste them. That's another glamorous aspect of it that uh, people definitely always always look at. Um, you know, and, and you know, people will openly you know express their envy of, of your position uh, when they see that those parts of it that people are never seem to be around when it comes time to do inventory or when the 100 <laughs> case delivery comes and has to be put up on the shelf, all of a sudden all the uh, uh, helpers are, are disappear. I know something about that. <laughs> Being a restaurant manager and, and having been a bar manager in pretty, pretty much every concept I've been in, inventory, you know, an upper wants to really do inventory with you, it's usually a chore and it's like, um, you know, the concepts I work, we, we do the inventory on a particular night of the week and instead of like the, the kitchen managers coming in at four or five in the morning doing their inventory, we're doing it after our 10 hours and now it's time to count liquor and beer and wine and um, yes, the, the person who's with you is just like, oh, I'm the one that got scheduled tonight to, to work with you. So um, yeah, it, so yeah, it's not all just glamour, right? Yeah. There's a lot of hard work that you put into it, I'm yes. sure. Besides the inventory, um, how do you decide what wines you put onto the list? I feel like I'm in a very fortunate time right now and that uh, uh, I'm not necessarily looking for wines that I deem worthy for the list. It's that there's a world of wines that are worthy for the list out there. It's a matter of uh, figuring out which ones fit the best in there or complement cuisine the most or things like that. So, so there's many, many great wines and, and uh, it's, it's great to be able to put them together. Uh, but, you know, there, there's many other wines that I could have on my list also. Okay, so um, uh, the menu here at Francesca, how often does it change? And then I'm, I would imagine that you, you kind of change your wine list at the same time or do you also change your wine list in between menu changes? The wine list is constantly evolving, so uh, I update it uh, monthly. Uh, there's always um, maybe two, three, or more bottles that are going out of inventory. We don't have any more to sell, and there's usually uh, two, three, or so new additions a month, too. Uh, so there's a um, steady evolution of the, of the list uh, with monthly updates. The chef is updating the uh, menu uh, almost seasonally. Uh, he does uh, spring and summer dishes, he'll do fall and winter dishes, and um, you know, the, but the, 
you know, wine is, is a constant change. Okay. When you're when you're doing the wine list part of things, um, and you're pairing it with the menu, are you when, when the new menu comes out? Are you, do you kind of know ahead of time so you can kind of plan, or is it more like you just kind of know what chef kind of his style or the type of ingredients he uses, and you just kind of work on the wine with that? There's uh, you know a lot of southwestern flavors and San Antonio flavors in the chef's cooking, and that would involve uh, chili peppers and some spicy complexity. Uh, there's also uh, masa often used and things like that. So those uh, kind of reoccurring ingredients, I would say, uh, lend themselves to um, things like viognier for white wines um, and also uh, syrahs for red wines. And uh, so I mean, we, we have a, a staple of wines in the list of the top okay. ingredients. All right. And then... Um, we're going to have uh, the Beckers here. I'm, I won't probably have a chance to talk with them, but uh, we're going to have some wines from Becker. Um, how much Texas wine do you incorporate into your list? Quite a bit. Um, we are becoming known for our Texas wine selection. Uh, I would say we're uh, over 36 Texas wine selections now out of a list that's 175 wines. So. Um, a significant amount and it, we are uh, steadily trying to grow that as we find uh, great world-class Texas wines. All right, that, that's, a, that's a lot of Texas wines. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in other restaurants that, that I either worked at, which most of our wine lists are not really that great, um, or they're, they're okay, they definitely don't match up to, to this type of level, um, but uh, or just going out to other restaurants really Texas wines um, don't seem to really have a prominent uh, spot on these lists. Um, is this because uh, the Southwest cuisine really lends itself to the Texas wines? Oh, it, it's um, been rewarding, kind of gratifying for, for myself as my wine career has advanced. The Texas wine industry has been improving. And so, um, you know, kind of started out serving, let's say, Texas Chardonnay and would often blind taste uh, guests on Texas Chardonnay as California Chardonnay. Uh, fortunately, in that instance, the uh, Texas Chardonnay is usually losing. Um, but as I became more savvy and uh, met more Texas uh, grape growers and winemakers and figuring out that we're a hot, dry climate that lends ourselves to things like the Viognier, uh, Syrah for reds, Tempranillo uh, also for reds, are is doing great here. Those hot climate uh, grape varieties are doing phenomenal. So uh, now I can pour a Texas Viognier side by side with the California French Viognier. Mm -hmm. The Texas Viognier would probably win. Um, and the uh, Tempranillos are coming up like on that world class level also. And so um, as the wineries are figuring that out and we're experiencing them as wines in the bottle, um, we're definitely getting to add more and more of those and feature them in our Texas wine tasting in Steinheimer's daily. Uh, between five and six, uh, we pour two ounces each of four different Texas wines and the flight is $10. And we have 20 different Texas wines in that lineup. And so a guest can come back five days room and not duplicate a wine and they get kind of a master's course on the Texas wine industry and then where we have been, where we are, and where we're going in the future. Awesome, I mean, and you know, being somebody that lives here in Texas and knowing that Texas is, you know, it's, it definitely is compared to California of 20, 30 years ago, and we're still catching up, um, but yet we've been making wine in Texas for as long as they have. Um, you know, I understand that the wineries, the, the winemakers are really trying to figure out what, what works for us. Um, I've talked with quite a few winemakers, and a lot of them really compare us with Spain uh, and seeing that so Tempranillo is really becoming a lot more planted. Uh, is there anything else that you see as being something that has potential for, I mean, Texas is huge, so you can't really just pinpoint just one thing, but say Hill Country, is there um, grapes that, other grapes that might be up and coming for us? You mentioned the Syrahs already. Um, I know a couple of wineries are experiencing, experimenting with uh, Alianico, uh, Italian uh, red grape. <laughs> uh, 
seems to be st hanging on the vine longer than other grapes and uh, has some uh, potential to be another uh, kind of uh, strange grape name for uh, Texans to learn. Yeah, there's, I guarantee you a lot of Texans would not know how to pronounce that, that grape. Um, well, you know, they're, they're learning how to pronounce Viognier and Tiffonio and uh, <laughs> uh, Bloc de, de Bois. Um, so, uh, which is a, a, you know, a hybrid grape that's doing well here. Um, you know, the, the black Spanish has a lot of uh, heat around it, if nothing else, mm -hmm. where everybody's uh, interested in it. Um, time will tell uh, how well it does for us. But, uh, you know, definitely our success is going to range with what we currently think of as other grape varieties and not with Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Merlot, and things like that. Right, and then I see that, you know, because the Texas winemakers have been experimenting with uh, some of the other things um, that, you know, they're seeing that maybe we're not, well, well, we, well we, it's not that we can't grow Chardonnay, Merlot, and Cab, maybe there's some other grapes we should look at. Um, let's talk about tonight with the wine pairings with the food, so let's, let's kind of go over the menu with that. Well, uh, they were, like you said, uh, blessed with Ernie Estrada working in the kitchen, um, Prior to this event, uh, Chef Estrada is tasting each of the wines and uh, with me and a couple other uh, key people here at the resort and we're taking notes on what we experience in the wine and then uh, talking about what we might expect in, uh, for the dishes and flavors. And so um, Chef creates many items to perfectly match the wine and uh, it's amazing the, uh, the pair, the food pair that comes up uh, to match the wines and uh, how great his, his palate is in that aspect and his creativity in, in making the dishes. So that's uh, definitely exciting. He's got a uh, cucumber soup paired with the uh, Provençal from Becker Vineyards. Okay. That's a uh, phenomenal food wine drink and uh, striking with a, a bright green soup and a uh, pale salmon pink wine. And uh, so, I mean, it's visually exciting and exciting with the taste buds too. The, uh, you know, other I think, striking thing is that the, the chefs wanted to put the sommelier selection Cabernet uh, with the dessert course. And so they put this chocolate like banana creation together uh, that mirrors the flavors in the wine. And, uh, you know, and so we're taking what we often think of as your main course wine Cabernet and putting it in the dessert. And uh, it's uh, another exciting, unexpected food and wine pairing and compliments of our chef. So um, let's, let's kind of talk about the, the sommelier selection wine. Um, talk to me about, uh, you know, what type of wine is it? Uh, uh, why did you go to, you know, why, why did you pair up with Rutherford rather than somebody else? Well, it, it's an uh, exciting concept. Uh, Raymond uh, invites uh, Raymond sommeliers <laughs> uh, every year uh, to the winery and they uh, uh, ask you to kind of give your input into the blending process. And uh, we were joking earlier, it's a little like a reality TV show and that you have these sommeliers where we're working in teams of two and working with component wines, which we had. Uh, Napa Cabernet, uh, Lake County Cabernet, and uh, Sonoma Cabernet, and then we had Napa Cabernet Franc, Sonoma Merlot, um, another Merlot also, and uh, we got to play with the quantities and the percentage and the balance of the wine and experiment ourselves and, and see how much a difference a uh, percentage change in one wine makes in the blend. And uh, it, it's funny because it seems real drastic as you're blending it. And then we went on to put our blends in a lineup against each other in blind tasting. And at that point, you know, have difficulty picking out which wine was your blend. And, and we're all voting on which one tastes the best and stuff like that. And um, it was interesting because there was kind of two camps in the room. There was a steakhouse camp that wanted to make the biggest bowls Cabernet that they possibly could. And then kind of the white tablecloth restaurant camp that wanted to make a wine that was smooth and very drinkable and you can't get your time to open up it was ready right out of the bottle. And uh, I think that's the, the camp that succeeded in the blending uh, and made a small selection in the wine vintage uh, that is just that. It's 
very easy drinking right out of the bottle, doesn't need decanting, has the red cherry, cocoa, and vanilla, and complex flavors. It's um, very satisfying. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, trying all this out. Um, uh, I don't get to do this very often, so I'm off from the day job all week. and. Uh, no, I think I need to do this every week for culinaria. Uh, be off for the same week as they are. Vacation time. Yeah, take vacation. It's a working vacation. Um, but I'm very excited to try everything that's on the menu. Try all the wines um, and uh, and the pairings because this is something where you know what what I do is I tend to just try the wine and I kind of think about what pairings would go well with it just based on my culinary experience, which is not not very broad, but much broader than it was say three years ago when I really started getting into all this. Um, but I'm really excited just to see these pairings and try this food and, and try the try the wine. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, do you have anything else you want to talk about about tonight or anything else? Well, it is definitely an exciting event. It uh, is a great moment for me in, in my career um, because we're able to have uh, Dr. Becker and his wines here, uh, the Raymond Winery, uh, Virginia Phillip. So you mentor me, that means my program is going to be here, so it's definitely uh, uh, personally gratifying and uh, it's going to be exciting about uh, the, the wines and the cuisine. Awesome. Well, um, we're going to wrap it up for this segment. Um, it's been a pleasure, Stephen, to have you on the show. Uh, Thank you. And actually talk with you a little bit more than just kind of a hi. We've, we've, we've met a few times, but we really haven't had to really talk a whole lot. Um, so it's really great to come in here and talk with you for a little bit. And um, uh, again, I just want to thank uh, the Weston and Francesca for allowing me to come in, uh, take some, take your time, uh, and to uh, get uh, get your thoughts and how everything's going to be for the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. All right. So now I have uh, I have Chef Ernie Estrada here with uh, Francesca here at uh, Weston La Cantera. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, tonight, and we're going to get a little information about him, see who he is, and and all that. And I really appreciate you taking some time because we're pretty close to the dinner, and he's agreed to uh, spend a few minutes with us. So uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and how how'd you get to Francesca. Uh, of course, I'm uh, Ernie Estrada. I've been here in San Antonio all my life, born and raised. Uh, I used to work for a great executive chef named uh, Franz Hendricks at a pizza time, the first bistro in San Antonio, which is actually uh, the, the first restaurant in San Antonio to actually serve Dr. Wow. Becker's wine. Okay, cool. So that, that's, that's pretty much my background. I remember everything. I did a seven year apprenticeship with him, like we used to do in the old days. <laughs> And um, then I found an opportunity here. Um, I took a step down from sous chef just to be a cook here to actually work with a uh, consultant chef, executive um, chef Mark Miller, which is pretty much the grandfather of Southwest Cuisine. So um, I took that demotion just to get here and actually work with him. And uh, he was he was a great, great, great guy to work with. I mean, he's amazing. He taught me a lot of things, how to layer flavors, you know, and, and think about. Like, uh, just give you an example. Like, I was eating the Snickers bar, and he was like, Why do you like the Snickers bar? And I was like, I don't know why you like it. And he actually made me think about why I like the Snickers bar. And he was like, I need you to go home and you need to write me an essay on why you like the Snickers bar. And then that's when I really started thinking about these things. Like, you know, I never knew why I was Snickers bar until that day until I actually started writing it down. So I started breaking down those things. And that, that, that's the kind of mentality that. That I bring into anything we do here at Francesca's now. I really analyze everything and and just everything has layers of you know flavors or you know, stories or whatever, and I try to bring that into the call. All right, awesome. Uh, so um, uh, Steve was talking about that you have pretty much a Southwest type of uh, style mm -hmm. for for Francesca. Yes. Talk to me about uh, kind of how you, how you I guess how you create all that. Uh, just yeah. it goes back again to working with some great chefs that were here before me while Mark Miller was being a chef. But I mean, you just do stuff like, um, like for me, for instance, it's, I take a lot of my grandmother's stuff. I take a lot of my 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 mother's background, which is you know, um, Native American and Mexican, and my grandfather's cuisines too. But you know, it, it all comes into the Southwest cuisine, which is it's just all around here. You know, we are part of the Southwest. So we use a lot of chiles, you know, um, uh, canela, which is, you know, the, the Mexican um, cinnamon, you know, and uh, 
Let's get brown sugar, but we bring in all those flavors into here. So um, it's just pretty much taking stuff from my roots and just bringing it to the masses. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's talk about the uh, the menu itself. Uh, if you can run kind of through the courses real quick and kind of give me the reasoning behind why you chose these types of courses for tonight. Well, it, it all stems from from all the wine selections, uh -huh. and um, they always bring something something nice and sometimes very unexpected. Um, so the first course is, of course, uh, we're doing a nice, it's going to be a light cucumber juice, which is some of the some of the flavors we got out of the wine. And um, I paired it with some nice watermelons right now, well, melons, because you know, everything's in season right now, so it's perfect. Nice, crisp, and sweet, and I, I tagged it with a little bit of some nice spiciness from here from local uh, chili uh, pekins. Okay. Which is spicy, but it's soft, soft spicy notes. And it goes away real fast. It's not there on the tongue forever. We're going to people drinking it all that stuff. So, um, and then we, we go into a nice crunch going with a poached pear salad. Some beautiful chardonnay. You'll see. You'll see. And, uh, Match it up with some watercress that we get here from San Antonio. Uh, watercress grows everywhere in San Antonio, so it's nice, delicious, crisp, it's a little summery. And um, paired that with a nice mint flower, so you have that nice pyramid flavor in there. And uh, a Granny Smith apple skin vinaigrette, so with that tartness, just to kind of to, to match with the wine, little overtones and stuff. So, um, and then that course is really, really nice. It looks really pretty. Once you see it, you're gonna, you're gonna be, you're gonna be wild by that one. That one's pretty, pretty nice. And I match that up with the saltiness of a, of a baked pancetta crisp. So it's really, really, really good. okay. So, um, and that one, that one, I just left kind of mild, no spiciness whatsoever. Just kind of give you a break because I love spice. So that's gonna be it. That one's that one's a nice one. And um, then we go into a nice uh, baked oyster, two point oyster that was freshly sh uh, shucked. And then uh, we mashed it with uh, here. Here we have Texas toast. Here we have Texas toast. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So it's nice, nice thick bread. So instead of making bread, I just decided to use Texas toast because it keeps that crunch. And um, we layered it in a ramekin. So. It's really, really nice. Uh, we put the crouton, uh, some shuck oysters in there with some nice rear cheese and all the that. If you've never had all the it's delicious. It's almost a flavor of licorice, licorice sassafras and a little bit of uh, beef beer. So okay. It's delicious, delicious herb. It's like a big dish if you want to give us some of it. It's big. And, uh, and a nice rear cheese. It's really nice, beautiful. And that is cheese. Yeah, with some nice caramelized uh, on top of it. Okay. And then, uh, then we go into the last course, well, not the last course, but uh, the, the main course, which is uh, the Broken Arrow Ranch uh, antelope tenderloin. So it's a nice baby sika, real pretty, real nice, tender, tender piece of meat. And um, that's local, that's what we eat in Texas. And then we matched it with uh, some roasted uh, Campari tomatoes. So we touch of cayenne and, um, and just a sprinkle of sea salt on top of it. So with some baked uh, celery. Okay. Baked celery is just delicious. It keeps its crispiness, but it loses a lot of that celery uh, flavor. Okay. So I'm not a fan of celery, but I love baked celery because it's really good. Raw celery. Can't like, wait to try that. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, honestly, I hate celery. But when you bake it, it, it loses a lot of that celery stuff. Flavors that I really don't like, and it makes it something to something that I really love. Okay. So I decided to match that with that, and I make a black bean caramel. So are we, are that we, one's really, really nice, nice and sweet. It's a beautiful way to see it. It's nice and black. It's just a black sauce. And uh, we match that with a nice uh, roasted carrots and, and red wine vinegar. That's just, just, just that nice bitterness that we need here for the overtones to match the fresh um, baby sika that we're putting on there. Okay. Then we have the dessert. The dessert is just, it's our take on Bananas Foster's. So, 
once you see it, you're going to be amazed. I don't want to talk too much about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't yeah. <laughs> wait to try that. And Steven's talking yeah. about how you've paired it with his wine, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm look really, really looking forward to trying right, it. Right, right. That one, that one. When we tasted the, the wine that uh, Stephen helped create, it was it was like uh, it was like a group of five of us. And our executive chef, my executive chef, uh, said, "You know what? This is this is like a dessert. This is like a dessert, you know." And I was like. That was, that was, it was awesome. Like, I never thought of that. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's make a dessert. Out of that. Yeah, so, so we matched it up with the dessert and it right back to the it, was, it was a good surprise. It was a good surprise. Because it doesn't have that dessert uh, dessert wine flavor to it. Right. But the, the wine just matches well. The, the dessert is great. So you're in for a treat today. Really nice treat. So it's just not, you know, just my input on everything. It's, it's you know, here, we, everybody puts their input, and we just make this so many memories. Awesome. Well, as you can see, we've got some people coming in behind us, uh, so they're starting to let some people in uh, because events are getting ready to start here. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up, let you get back to the kitchen so we can make that, you know, make sure all that amazing food comes out perfect. And I uh, really appreciate you coming in uh, or coming by, uh, spend a few minutes with me. Uh, I cannot wait to try all this stuff um, associated with culinaria. Uh, I'll have some other stuff going on. I've got the grand tasting. I'll be uh, interviewing some people with the grand tasting on Saturday. So um, look for that. That's probably going to be another week since this is a weekly show. I've got all this culinaria stuff and <laughs> I, don't, I don't have all the time to put it together. But um, again, really appreciate you. I appreciate uh, uh, the Weston working with me and allowing me to come in and do some filming. And um, that's going to be it. Um, as always, thank you for stopping by. Stop by the website. Leave some comments below. Friend me up above. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time.